Well, if you will, open your Bibles with me uh, today to John's Gospel, chapter 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. And I want to look at verses 15 through 31 today in the message. Uh, we started a series of messages a couple of weeks ago that we have called God Expectations. And one of the things in the series that we're doing is we're asking a question. And the question that we're asking is simply this. Does God expect anything from us? Does God expect anything from you? Does he expect anything from me? And if the answer to that question is yes, that God does expect things from us, then what does God expect? We have defined those things as the big four. And we're beginning to study those four things that God truly expects of every one of us as his people. He expects us, number one, to believe him. He expects us, number two, to love him. He expects us, number three, to obey him. And then number four, he expects us to glorify him. We've been walking through those big four. We started with the first message and we talked about God expects us to believe him. The message was believe me. And the key thought of that message was faith is the way God expects us to live. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 3 taught us that, that concept of faith. It's by faith we live and not by sight. In fact, that passage even told us that it is impossible to please God except by faith. Faith is the way God expects us to live. And then in the second message that we brought in the series, we, we learned that God expects us to love him. Love me was the title of the message. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 34 through 40 taught us that love is the standard that God expects of us. Love is the standard. It's the banner that should fly over the life of every Christian. It's the banner that should fly over the steeple of every church. God expects us to love Him. Today, I want you to notice from John chapter 14 that God expects us to obey Him. The message is entitled, Obey Me. And it comes from John chapter 14. And I want to read just a, a couple of passages of Scripture for you. But before I read those passages to you, I want to give you the key thought because I want to mention this a couple of times or so in the course of the message. And the key thought out of these verses that God wants us to get is simply this. Obedience is the proof of our love for Jesus and respect of his authority over us. Love is the, or obedience is the proof of our love for Jesus and respect of his authority over us. I want you to look in John 14, beginning with verse 15, and it says, <clears throat> If you love me, keep my commands, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And then down in verse number 22, it says, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Obedience is the proof of our love for Jesus and respect for his authority over us. Obedience is the key. I love the story of Roger Stobe. He's a great quarterback uh, for uh, the Dallas Cowboys back in the day. Roger Stobe tells in his story uh, uh, a story of struggle 
and also success in football. He was a talented player. Uh, he was the 1963 Heisman Trophy winner. He, he uh, went to the Naval Academy, graduated there, served uh, his country in combat. And then he came back in 1969. He became quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. His struggle of success and failure and difficulty was not so much on the field as it was off the field. Roger Staubach's coach was the legendary Tom Landry. Tom Landry was a great uh, coach for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, he, uh, he came in 1960 and he coached from 1960 to 1988. He, uh, he led Dallas to 20 consecutive winning seasons of his 29 season starts as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Roger Staubach recognized that Coach Landry as a great football strategist, but he believed in his own heart that as quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, he ought to be able to run his team and quarterback his team and call his plays. You see, Tom Landry would not allow Roger Staubach to call his plays. He said in every play that the quarterback made, he told Roger when uh, to pass, he told him when to run, he told him how he wanted it passed, he told him where he wanted the ball handed off, he told him everything, and Roger Staubach in his own words said, he had a decision upon becoming quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys to make. Will I disobey my coach and probably not remain on this team or will I obey my coach and remain the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys? Roger Staubach said it was not until he decided to obey his coach that harmony, unity, success, and victory became a part of his life and the Dallas Cowboy team. You see, obedience is so important. If there is no obedience, then there is a struggle. And, and, and that's what really is, it, it is a problem in the life of the church today. I think one of the biggest issues that the church, is, church faces today is the issue of disobedience. I think one of the biggest problems that exist within the church today is that its members are disobedient to God. You see, obedience is not an easy thing. You know how I know obedience is not easy? I know that obedience is not easy because of what I've seen in recent weeks on Facebook and listening to the comments of people. You know, we push back. We've even pushed back against uh, uh, rules and regulations that have come down from government officials, whether that be the president or the, or, or the, or the governor or the mayor of, of cities. And, and it's because we just don't want anybody telling us what to do. You might get by with that in life, but you will not get by with that when it comes to God. You will not have the favor of God. You will not experience the power of God. You will not know the peace of God until, like Roger Staubach, you settle the issue of who is in control, who's calling the plays in your life, and who it is that you are really going to follow. You see, Jesus had been talking to the disciples about his love for them. Jesus had declared his love for the disciples in other passages. Jesus had uh, demonstrated his love for the disciples in the washing of their feet. And in just a little bit, Jesus is going to display his love for them as he lays his life down on the cross of Calvary. But it's in this story that Jesus turns the tables on the disciples. And rather than discussing here his love for them, he now asks them, what about your love for me? We've already discussed that God wants us to believe him and to love him, but watch this. Obedience is the proof of my love for Jesus and my respect of his authority over my life. And so Jesus gives the disciples the key, really, to the Christian life. And it is this issue of obedience. So I want you to look with me as we work through this passage of Scripture this morning. And I want you to notice some really significant key thoughts about this matter of obey me. First of all, I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture what I'm going to call the secret 
of obedience. The secret of obedience. And I want to read it for you. And it's in just a simple phrase of Scripture. Verse 15 says, Jesus said this, If you love me, keep my commandments. He said it again in verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Did you see it? The secret. The secret of obedience. What is the secret of obedience? I want you to write this down. I don't want you to miss this. Here is the secret of obedience. What's the secret of obedience? Love for God is the secret of obedience. Now notice that little phrase. He said, uh, that phrase in verse 15, he says, If you love me, similar phrase in verse 23. Look at the phrase for a moment. There are three things in that phrase I want you to see really quickly right now. I want you to notice, first of all, in this secret of obedience, I want you to notice the the, uh, condition that he discusses. You notice the condition? He says, if, if you love me. There's the condition. If you remember your high school grammar, you understand a conditional sentence. A conditional sentence is an if... Followed by the proposition. And so here is a conditional sentence. Jesus says, if you love me. And and watch this. Jesus isn't saying to the disciples that you do love me. He isn't even saying to the disciples that you don't love me. Jesus says, if you love me. It's a condition here that he attaches to it. You see, one of the ways that you know I love you. Well, let me use this example. One of the ways my wife knows that I love her is that I tell her. But another way that my wife knows that I love her is that I show her. Jesus is asking here more than just saying you love Him. You see, obedience is the proof that we love Him. Doing what He asks us to do is the proof. So there's the condition that He discusses, but also I want you to notice the conduct that He describes. He says, if you, and watch Love. There's the conduct. Love. Love is the key. Love is the motive. And in this stay-at-home order from the governor, I have have really watched way too many crime scene shows. And one of the things that they're always looking for in the crime scene is, what is the motive? Well, guess what? Jesus is interested in the motive. He's interested in why it is that we do what we do. Why it is that we serve Him. And and what Jesus wants is Jesus wants it to be out of love. You see, there, there, there are several motivations for doing what you do. One, there is the there is the fear motivator. In other words, that motivator says, I have to. I have to. If I don't, then here's what's going to happen. A lot of people go to work because they have to. They, they fear that if they don't go, they're going to lose their job. Some children do what they do for their parents because they feel like they have to. It, it, it's not a motivation. Of, it's a motivation of fear. Fear is a motivational level that people live on. It's not the best level to live on. And then, of course, secondly, there is the there is the level of duty. I ought to. Hey, some folks come to church because they feel like, well, I ought to go. I've even heard that. Well, I ought to go. It's Sunday. I ought to go. Well, listen. There's there's a higher level. There's a higher motivation than than duty or fear. And, and here's what it is. It's love. Love is the highest motivation for doing what you do. And, and you see, Jesus doesn't want us to, to, to do what we do for Him because we, we have to or because we ought to. Here's the motivation of love. I want to. So He talks about the condition, the conduct. And then finally the conclusion that He draws. Notice He says, if you love, watch, me. Love is not about something. Love is about someone. And it is our love for that one that changes our attitude and our outlook about everything that we do. I'm telling you, if you don't do what you do for God out of love, then here's what's going to happen. 
that duty is, become, is going to become drudgery and that drudgery will rob you of the delight of what you do. And I'm telling you, there are people in the church who aren't delighted to be a part of the service of the church. I love a story that I read about a lady who got married to a, to a, to a really hard, ungrateful, demanding man. In fact, after their marriage, she, he, he laid out a whole list of demands for her. Chores that he demanded that she do. Things that he expected for her to do around the house. Uh, clothes that were to be washed in a certain way and at a certain time. Uh, 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 you know, dinner to be served in a certain way and at a certain time. He was just very demanding. And then even when she did do the things that he requested of her or expected her to do, he, he was never grateful or thankful or loving. For 25 years, she lived in that relationship. Doing what she did. And she hated many of those years. And then her husband died. She vowed that she'd never marry again. But four years later, she met a kind, compassionate, caring person. And she married him. They lived a beautiful life together. One day as she was doing some house cleaning and going through some things, she opened up a box. And in that box, she came across that list of demands that her first husband had given her. She hadn't seen that list in years and years. She pulled it out and she began to read down it. And the more she read, the more she smiled. You see, on that list were things that she was doing now and even more. But the difference was love. She had responded to one who loved her, who, who, who cared for her, and who was compassionate toward her. And her response to him was to do all that she used to do and more because love was the motivation. Why do you do what you do? Jesus says the secret to obedience is love. Love is what puts the delight in obedience. I want you to notice not only the secret of obedience, but number two, the standard of obedience. What is the standard of obedience? I know you know you need a standard for everything. We had some storms come through and part of the barn got blown off down at the house. And so we're putting that tin back on and some boards got broke up there. Well, well how do I know the length of board from the ground that needs to be on the roof at the top. Well, I got a measuring tape. I have a standard to go by. And we put the standard up there on the top of the roof where the boards were broken off. We take the standard down and measure the board on the ground, cut it off, and it fits perfectly because we follow the standard. Well, what is the standard of obedience? And God tells us right here. Notice the phrase again. If you love me, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 23, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words. The secret of obedience is love for God. The standard of obedience is the word of God. It's the Bible. It's the words of God. That's what he says. If, if you really love me, then the proof of your love for me will be your obedience to my words, to my commands, to whatever it is that I ask you to do. Now notice he says in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands, keep my words. Verse 23. I want you to notice three quick things here about the standard of obedience, which is the word of God. I want you to notice first that this verse implies the opening of the word. He says, if anyone keeps my words, if anyone keeps my commandments, well, how do you keep something if you don't know what it is? How can you treasure something if you don't have the treasure? So how, how is it that we know what God wants from us? How, how do we know what God's asking us to do? We know by reading the Bible. 
That's why the opening of the Word of God is so important. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible. Hey, how are you coming along on your reading plan? You know, we have a reading plan here. I just thought I'd remind you of that. We have a, a, a 52 week reading plan through the new. Where are you in that reading? Have you dropped it? Have you forgotten it? Is that what you do to the Word of God? Then you, you wonder why you don't know what God wants in your life? You haven't opened the book. That's why reading is so important. The opening of the Word of God. But then notice not only the opening, but the obeying of the Word of God. Notice what he says in verse number 15. If you love me, he says, keep my commands. Obedience to the Word of God is so important. Once I know what God wants from me, then he says the next step is to obey that. Do what I ask you to do. Follow my commands. Obey what I say. And then the reason that's so important is the last thought about the standard of obedience, which is the Word of God. And that is the outpouring of the Word. I want you to watch this. Don't miss this now. We didn't read it, but I'm going to point it out to you. I don't want you to... This is so very important. As you open the Word and read it, and then as you see what God wants from your life, you obey it. God will outpour something into your life. I want you to see what God will do. Now, notice what Jesus said in verse number 19. He says, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, so you've been opening and you're obeying, watch that, keeps them. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me, he will be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and what? Manifest myself to him. Here is why obedience to what God asks us to do is so important. When we obey what he asks, he then outpours himself to us. He manifests, he makes clear, he helps us understand his word. I, I'm at peace. Well, I, I just don't read the Bible because I don't understand it. Well, maybe one of the reasons that you don't understand the Bible is because you won't obey the Bible. See, let me give you a little tip. You'll never understand more of the Bible until you first start obeying the parts of the Bible that you already know to do. So if I know God says I ought to tithe and I won't do that, guess what? He isn't going to manifest himself to me beyond that. If I know God wants me to witness and I don't do that, and I, he, he isn't going to manifest himself to me beyond that. If, if I know God wants me to be in church and I'm not there, if I know God wants me to be faithful to his word and I'm not doing it, then he isn't going to manifest himself to me. And so we wonder why Christianity doesn't work. It doesn't work because we aren't obedient to the word of God. You see, the secret of obedience is the love of God. The standard of obedience is the Word of God. And finally, in this passage, the strength of obedience. You say, I'll be honest with you, preacher, it's hard to obey. And it is. You say, man, this, this thing of living the Christian life, it's a hard life. No, it's an impossible life to live in your own strength. But notice in verse 16, Jesus said, I'll pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. See the strength of obedience is the spirit of God. The secret of obedience is the love of God. The standard of obedience is the word of God. But the strength to do what God asks us to do is the spirit of God. See, God wants us to obey Him. He wants us to love Him. He wants us to believe Him. But my friend, He didn't leave you all on your own to do it. He has sent us the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice three quick things about the Spirit. I want you to notice the promise that He states. Jesus said in verse 16, I will pray the Father. 
Jesus has told them, I'm going away. I'm about to leave. But I'm going to pray to the Father. And He's going to send you a gift. Listen to me this morning. If you're a new child of God, if you've just come to Christ, the first gift that God gives you as His child is the Holy Spirit. at salvation that comes to live within you. So the power to be what God saved you to be, the power to obey and believe and love Him, you have that power in your life right now. That's the promise. But I want you to notice not only the promise, but the power He shows. Notice what He says in verse 15. I'll pray the Father and He will give you another helper. And that word another is interesting. It, it, it means another. Of the same kind. Jesus said, I'm about to leave. I'm about to go away. I'm about to no longer be here. I'm no, I'm no longer going to be in your presence. You're no longer going to be able to see me. But I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm not leaving you powerless. I'm giving you a power. And that power is the Holy Spirit of God. And, and, and He's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. He's going to abide with you forever. He's never ever going to leave you. He's always going to be a power source in your life. The issue is whether or not we will obey. Oftentimes, at a football game, there will be people in the press box calling plays to the guy who's walking the sidelines with a headset. The plays are called in the press box. The plays are discussed in the press box because the person in the press box has a better perception of what's happening on the field because of his vantage point. And he talks to the person on the sidelines of the plays sent in. You and I are on the field of life. We're in the game. We're, we're, we're living out the Christian life. But there is a press box. And it's a heavenly press box. And God Almighty is in the press box. And His Son is by His side. And the signals are being sent down to the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And only through obedience can we hear those signals. And only when we obey what He asks us to do can we run the play that will make a score for the team. It's the power. It's the power that he shows us. But finally the peace he shares. When we follow the Holy Spirit, when we obey the guidelines and rules of God's words and commands, it produces something in our life. And the Bible tells us what that is. It's, it's peace. Jesus said in this passage of Scripture, In verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. What's the result of obedience? The benefit of obeying is peace. Now, listen carefully. Because when we think about peace, we're thinking about something different than Jesus thought about. Because when we think about peace, we're thinking about the absence of trouble or the absence of trials or, or I defeated cancer. Well, where was Jesus headed when he said, I'm going to give you my peace? Jesus was headed to the cross. He was headed to, to a trial. He was headed to, to, to a, 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 a scandalous trial where they would spit in his face and beat him within an inch of his life and then take his life on the cross. But he had peace because he was obeying the will of the Father. Peace doesn't mean you won't have trouble. Peace doesn't mean you won't have to navigate through difficult circumstances like what we're doing now. It's kind of like the other week when all those storms rolled through. And they were predicting such severe weather. And you know what? My wife and I have a storm shelter. Man, we had, we had blankets down in that thing. And we had refreshments down in that thing. And, 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 and look, I've gone in that storm shelter. And while I don't know what's happening on the outside with the storm, down within, I'm calm. I'm at peace. Because I feel safe where I am. There's a storm raging, but I have peace. 
I don't know what it'll look like when I come out, but I have peace because I know I'm okay and my family is okay. And so because those I love are okay, it's going to be okay. That's the peace that Jesus gives. It's a calm security that because I'm obeying him, I'm in the shelter of his security and love. And it is going to be okay. The peace that he had all hinges on obedience. A man had been invited to visit the palace of the king. And he had gone. And he had enjoyed a great time of fellowship. And the king enjoyed his fellowship. And he enjoyed the fellowship of the king. And when the invitation came to an end, the king said, I'm going to send you an invitation to come and dine with me one evening, evening at the palace. Sure enough, a few weeks later, the man received an invitation in the mail, a formal invitation from the king of that country to come and dine with him. He didn't respond to the invitation, but on the day when he was supposed to dine with the king, he showed up at the palace. He told the palace guards who he was. He told them why he was there. They went in and, and got the king and brought him out and, and the king uh, you know greeted him and then as they were walking into the palace he said to him he said I, I i wasn't expecting you today what is it that brings you to the palace he looked at the king and said did not you send me an invitation to dine with you this evening he said i did but you didn't respond to the invitation he looked at the king and said a king's invitation doesn't have to be answered. It just has to be obeyed. And I want to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, God is waiting for people to obey Him. Are you obeying Him? Are you following Him? Are you heeding His words? Because I want to tell you, that's what makes the difference in a believer's life. And I'll tell you where every one of us are this morning. You're either on the road of peace or you're in the ditch of disobedience. It's one or the other. It's not both and. Either you're obeying and you're experiencing the peace of God, the peace Jesus said, I leave you, or you're disobeying and you're off in the ditch of disobedience. You see, most Christians are enduring the Christian life rather than enjoying it. And the reason is the difference between obedience and disobedience. Would you bow together with me for a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your precious word. Thank you, Father, for the inspiration and revelation of this text to make obedience so simple. The secret is our love for you. The standard is your word and what you tell us to do. Father, the strength is the Spirit of God that lives within us. May we obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ today. If you've been listening to this service, if you've been worshiping with us in this message, with it, during this message, then I want to encourage you to connect with us by connecting with God. Today, I want to encourage you to reach out to Him, to obey Him. How do I do that, preacher? Well, the first thing, if you're lost today, is to call unto Him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is giving you an invitation today to be saved. And I want to tell you that the invitation of a king doesn't have to be answered. It just has to be obeyed. And I'm encouraging you and inviting you to do that. And if you will, trust Christ and reach out and connect with us. We want to send you some materials, a little spiritual commitment guide we'll, we'll send to you. That will highlight the decision that you're making. If it's a, to trust Christ or to rededicate yourself to Him. We'll send you a little baptismal pamphlet that tells you the next step that you need to take. After having trusted Jesus as personal Savior. And we'll also send you a Living in Christ booklet. A little 
booklet of four studies that will help you get started on the journey of faith, love, and obedience. But your first step is to reach out and connect to us. Do you know Christ as Savior? Have you trusted Him? Let me encourage you to do that today by simply praying and inviting Him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life. If you are saved today, let me ask you, are you obedient? You see, either we are obedient believers or disobedient. Either we are enjoying the life or enduring it. Which is it with you? Maybe it's because somewhere back, as a believer, you've disobeyed something God asked you to do. What about going back and saying, God, I understand it now. Forgive me for my disobedience. And now guide me into your favor as I obey you. Jesus said to his disciples, here's how you'll know and I'll know that you love me. It boils down to two words. Obey me. I pray that today we'll live a life of obedience unto the Lord. Thank you for being here, being a part of worship with us today. God bless you. Join us this evening at 6 o'clock as we worship again online church.